John Adams Letters from the Front podcast for November 1917. This podcast looks at life in World War I through the letters of John Adams, who was 23 when he joined up in September 1914. He served with the 9th Service Battalion, Royal Irish Fusiliers, and was involved in many significant events on the Western Front, particularly Passchendaele. These are his words, read by his grandchildren and narrated by his great-grandchildren. This month we have three correspondents from John Adams. One is a field postcard to say he was sick. One is to explain what happened while he doesn't really explain and one is to talk about his convalescence. These are quite interesting history parts to us. We know that John Adams was gassed in World War I just from the fact that from his obituary uh, it mentions he was gassed once. Possibly this illness has come from those times he was gassed. We can only theorise because we've got no evidence of when or where he was gassed. So this month in our history section we're going to look at the gas attacks. It's hard to imagine living in a trench. It's even harder to imagine living in a trench where there are bullets flying over your head and shells exploding right next to you. And there's no way I can imagine living in a trench with bullets, the shells and the constant threat of gas attacks. What were the gas attacks like? We will hear about this in our history section. My name's Mark Adams and John Adams was my grandfather. The conditions in trenches were unimaginable. Lice and rats thrived in the dank, muddy conditions. It was dangerous to use the latrines because the Germans knew where they were and often targeted them, as well as shelling and stray bullets. There could hardly be anything to make the conditions more hellish. But war has a way of surpassing expectations and chemical warfare was developed during this time. Although one of World War I's most horrible weapons, poison gas was not one of its most deadly. Very few soldiers who were gassed died, probably somewhere under 5%. However, this number is understated if you count the soldiers flushed out of their positions due to the gas and thus cut down by enemy gunfire. The first soldiers to use chemical attacks were the French in 1914, with grenades filled with tear gas, ethyl bromoacetate, which is an irritant rather than fatal. The level of gas is used developed during the war. In January 1915, the first large-scale gas attack was launched by the Germans at Russian positions near Warsaw, but unfavourable wind blew the gas back towards the German trenches and the freezing conditions froze the gas, rendering the attack ineffective. Chlorine gas was used in the summer of 1915, launched by the Germans against the French at Ypres. The chlorine gas was released and let drift with the wind towards the enemy trenches. Thousands of French soldiers died, either choking on the gas or being gunned down as they escaped out of the trenches. As the gas was heavier than air, it would settle in the trenches, forcing soldiers out into the open. The problem with using chlorine gas was that it was a green mist, letting the enemy know that an attack was coming, and chlorine was water soluble, so those that who did not have a gas mask could use a wet cloth over the mouth to help protect them. The gases used in World War I came in four main categories. Respiratory irritants, lacrimators, known as tear gases, sternutators, which cause sneezing, and vesicants, which cause blistering. Often different kinds were used together to inflict the maximum possible damage. Tear gas was first used in 1914. It would irritate mucous membranes in the eyes, mouth, throat, and lungs, incapacitating due to coughing, crying, and breathing difficulties. There are no recorded deaths with this gas. Chlorine was introduced in 1915. A yellow-green gas with the smell of bleach, it would react with the water in the lungs, forming hydrochloric acid. This caused coughing, vomiting and irritation to the eyes. Whilst devastating, with the introduction of gas masks, it limited fatalities to below 1,100 during the war. Phosgene and diphosgene were colourless with a musty odour. It was first used in late 1915 and as it reacted in the lungs, it caused difficulty in breathing and irritation in the eyes and throat. Some of the effects can be delayed for up to 48 hours, so the soldiers didn't know the gas was there until it was too late. Around 85% of gas fatalities in World War I are due to this gas. Mustard gas, which was introduced by the Germans in 1917 in Ypres, is probably the most infamous of the World War I gases. 
Released in a yellow brown colour and a harsh smell similar to garlic or horseradish, it would cause damage to the eyes and respiratory tract. These could be countered by a gas mask, but the gas also burned skin with some horrific burns. Whilst only 2-3% to of those affected died from mustard gas, it left some with debilitating effects. The most gas was produced by Germany, totalling 68,000 tonnes. The British and French were the closest after that with 25,000 and 37,000 tonnes respectively. No other nation came close to this volume of gas production. We know that John Adams was caught in at least one gas attack and it affected him throughout his life, which is one of the many ways in which the First World War would live with these soldiers for the rest of their lives. Wednesday, 14th November 1917, Field Postcard. I have been admitted into hospital, sick, and am going on well. I am being sent down to the base. Letter follows at first opportunity. Sunday, 18th November 1917, British Expeditionary Force. We're not sure what has happened here, but from the next letter, John appears to be in number two convalescent camp in Rouen. We know that he was gassed, so a recurrence of respiratory infection could have put him in hospital. Mr Torrey was the Reverend Edwin George Torrey, the minister of Kings Mills Presbyterian Church from 1914 to 1920, who served as a private in the Royal Army Medical Corps from May 1916 until June 1919. The source of that is the the book The History of Kings Mills Presbyterian Church, which John and his family were all members of. My dear mother, I now take the pleasure of writing a few lines home, hoping it will find yourself and all there still in your usual good health, as this leaves myself not too bad at the present. I am out of hospital again and getting on all right. I am getting down to the base depot today, so I expect to be back with the battalion in a few days. I am sure you imagined all sorts of things when I did not write to you, but to tell you the truth, I was not able. Although it was nothing more than a severe cold. But you need have no fear for me as I am getting quite alright again. I got no letters since I went into hospital so I am uneasy to know how you all are doing. I had rather a nice letter from Mr Tory on the day I left the battalion. It was very nice of him to think of writing to me. The weather has got quite nice this last while and I do hope it may continue. We had rather a wet weather just before I went into hospital, and I think that was what set me up. Well, it is wearing round to Christmas again, and my fourth Christmas from home. Who would think it was so long? But perhaps it may be over for Christmas 1918. At least I hope it may be. Well, I shall think long until I get back to the battalion, until I get a letter from home. I think this is all for now, so I will close for this time, hoping all at home are in good health. Goodbye. I remain your loving son, Johnny. I do not think I am going back to battalion yet. Something has turned up for me, but I cannot tell you yet, so do not write again until you hear from me again. Tuesday 20th November 1917 13971 Sergeant John Adams, Royal Irish Fusiliers Number 2 Convalescent Depot, Rouen, British Expeditionary Force, Farming. My dear mother, just a few lines to let you know that I am still living and well. Hope yourself and all at home are the same at present. I said the last letter I wrote not to write to me again until you hear from me. I was at the convalescent camp at the time, so I did not like to give you any address until I should see if I was staying or not. But just as I was finishing your letter, the RSN sent for me to see if I should like to go in charge of a party of men to work in the French farm until I get back my health again. I need not say that I jumped at the chance, so that is what I am at now. I am about 9 miles out of ruin, but the letters have to go through the convalescent camp. What a lovely country to live in. I believe I would live here all my life. I may be here one month and I may be here more, so I should like to hear from home as soon as ever as I am uneasy until I get word. I am getting quite fit again since I came to live here. 
I would like to write to Jeannie and give her my address, as I have not time to do so now. This is all at present, hoping to hear from you soon. Goodbye, your loving son, Johnny. Thank you for listening to John Adams' Letters from the Front podcast. To find out more about John Adams and his family, visit www.johnadams.org.uk forward slash letters. The History of the Ninth Service Battalion, Royal Irish Fusiliers, during the World War I is taken from the Blackers Boys. Visit them at www9 irishfusiliers.co.uk with the number 9. Podcast will be published a hundred years after the letters were written, so will be published nearly every month. This has been a Mark Smith production. Mm-hmm.